Uh, okay, Eyal is here. So Eyal is here. Hello, friends. Hi, I am not in an ideal. I'm not in an ideal situation. I had to run around to find the the internet on the island here cut off. I'm sitting in a cafe. It's going to be quite noisy. But this is what we have, and with this, we need to win. <laughs> okay. Um, just give me one moment. Um, we'll make sure that everything is being broadcast properly now that we are ready to go. Yes. Shall we begin? Uh, uh, would it be on YouTube? Just a second, because I sent links for you. It is on YouTube. You need to YouTube. allow me to share screen, guys. Uh, somebody, whoever is running this. Uh... Yes, I've, uh, uh, yes, I've, uh, yes, I've uh, whoever is running it. it, please allow me to share screen. Yeah. OK. So yeah, I'm just going to introduce uh, everybody to the Porsche uh, studio. And uh, introduce you uh, uh, formally a little bit. You hear me? Can you can you signal can you hear me by raising a thumb up? Okay, okay great. Let me know where to start. Yeah, I'm just going to introduce the platform uh, and uh, formally introduce you and uh, 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 Sharon, and then we can begin. So, uh, just a little bit about. Uh, Porsche Studio and the Porsche Conversations. Uh, Sudipta, who um, is here with us and uh, very much um, uh, a co-conspirator in this endeavor. We started it a, a year ago, a little more than a year ago uh, with the lockdown. Uh, the idea was uh, to request uh, you all to please uh, put your mic off. I request everybody to put one outside. Okay. Is that the way I can put it? We can't hear you. I mean, there's some strange stuff. No problem. I think no problem. Yes, there is a way that you can force mute him if you're the host. I, I'm using myself when I'm not speaking, that's all. Enjoying these classes. Online class, I'm on Adigan on Yeah, it was actually Durgan, and I'll take him up on it later. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, can everybody hear me? Now, yes. Yeah, all right. So uh, just to get back to this, uh, Porsche was an initiative we started uh, last year, Sudipto and myself. And the idea was uh, both to have online studios, uh, but to focus them uh, around issues that were pertinent and current, uh, not necessarily abstract issues that normally uh, get foregrounded in institutions of architecture. Uh, the idea was also to have an uh, interdisciplinary approach where we would invite people from a, a large variety of backgrounds and the studios would also have students or participants from uh, uh, not necessarily only architecture in order to inform the process. Uh, the topics we would choose therefore would need to be broad enough to, uh, uh, to allow people to uh, uh, participate in different ways. Uh, the first uh, Porsche studio and the conversations around it uh, were titled Alter Ego. We were looking at uh, the... Uh, yeah. So we were looking at the cultural geography of uh, Delhi, New Delhi, which is uh, which has become the site for uh, the various contentions, pushes, and pulls of our democracy in uh, 
uh, as a physical space, um, there seem to be many invisible and uh, virtual clandestine uh, forces at play and uh, really appreciate the work that forensic architecture does in making many of these things that are invisible, visible. Uh, and I think that that's one of the interests we have in the, in the work that ER does. Uh, with that, let me um, just say that uh, uh, today's talk is also the first in what will be our second series, which we are calling the Dystopia series, where we hope to have people talking about uh, things uh, from literature to poetry to the city to politics. Uh, and Yali will be uh, starting kicking this uh, process off. Uh, let me just uh, introduce you uh, formally. So uh, Eyal Weisman is the founding director of forensic architecture and uh, professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. The author of over 15 books, he has held positions in many universities worldwide, including Princeton, FAH Zurich, and the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. He is a member of the Technology Advisory Board of the International Criminal Court and the Center for Investigative Journalism. In 2019, he was elected, elected Life Fellow at the British Academy and appointed member of the Order of the British Empire, MBE. In 2020, uh, New Year's Honours for Services to Architecture. In 2020, he was elected the Richard Van Weissacker Fellow at the Bosch Academy. He has studied architecture at the Architectural Association, graduating in 1998. He received his PhD in 2006 from the London Consortium at Purbeck, University of London. Uh, Eyal, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please take the floor. Thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it's a great honor, actually, to speak to you. Uh, and you also to connect. Do you hear me? I Yes, do you hear me? Oh, I, hear a, I hear an echo of myself in a strange way, but. Uh, maybe everybody else could mute so that the echo uh, is not so strong. But it's it's absolutely brilliant to speak to you. Uh, it's particularly interesting for me uh, to speak together with Sharon Mashbach for many years. Sorry, I, I I see I see people um, signaling to me that that this is not my my audio is not coming through. Is it true? I hear it. It's not your problem. Someone, uh, everybody should mute while you are, you are talking, I think. That's what we... Yeah, yeah. Of course, yes, I mute think yourself. Yes, you can mute yourself. Yeah. I'm muting myself. Everybody should mute you. Uh, also, it could be muted centrally uh, by uh, whoever is the coordinator of the Zoom. Anyway, it's absolutely, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. I'm, I'm really happy to start engaging um, an audience and the kind of... Uh, the thinking that uh, you've developed it, Posh, in in uh, in India, and to connect to Indian civil society, I have been in touch with many people through our research on on Pegasus, um, and uh, I feel that this incredible amount of affinities. Um, it's also a great honor for me to speak together with my friend uh, Sean Rothbard, who um, I'll just you know I'll just say is. Uh, has been almost like a, a kind of not only my publisher, but like a mentor for many years. And a lot of the ideas that you would hear, and a lot I think of the conversation that you'd hear between us, are ideas that evolved in in conversations that I think right now it's kind of twenty years of conversation about the relationship between architecture, violence, strategy, urbanism, and so forth. Today. Uh, in response to the very provocative um, presentation of the theme of this lecture, uh, I wanted to speak about things that are slightly more invisible than what we, you may know our work for, the kind of kinetic violence, the incident, right? I mean, a lot of the work of forensic architecture is counter-investigating state violence, you know, we, 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 from the smallest scale, from the split second scenarios of 
um, an Israeli police officer or an Israeli soldier shooting, killing Palestinian civilians, uh, justifying that as a split second decision from this molecular level of time, the split second uh, incidents that we reconstruct using multiple video evidence. Uh, to kind of apocal latencies and um, and the long duration of uh, climate change, environmental destruction, we also investigate around the world, uh, not only in Israel, Palestine, but our investigation now extend from Mexico to uh, Indonesia, to Guatemala, Colombia, the US, Germany, etc. Today, I wanted to speak about something that is different, not so much that sort of billiard ball universe in which things hit things and you have to analyze bodies in space, but how do you do counter investigation, which is always what we do, investigating state violence on something that is much more uh, invisible. Uh, and these are clouds. So I wanna share some of our thinking uh, about clouds and uh, under a rubric that I would call cloud studies. Clouds are exactly the opposite of that incident analysis that we speak about. And when you see how we define clouds, uh, they're not only meteorological, but political events that occupy an ambient, they occupy a space, they are amorphous, they are transforming, but they are not less lethal. So here is how I personally got involved with what we call cloud studies. Back in 2008, there was one, perhaps the first of a sequence of horrific bombing that Israel conducted over the Gaza Strip. Um, they have bombed um, um, you know, civilian infrastructure, killing 2,000 people round about. I was in London at the time and I had a strange job. Um, I was working with B'Tselem, a human rights organization in Israel, Palestine. And what they said to me was that they did not want to call into Gaza with Israeli um, um, sort of dialing code because that could endanger people. Uh, but they wanted to keep in touch with several people that they were in contact with to see how they were. So from London, I made those calls uh, into the war asking people how they were and sending the information back uh, to B'Tselem in, um, in, in, in Israel, Palestine. Um, one of the people I spoke to told me something that remained with me and that I have not since forgotten. He said, my building has evaporated from solid to gas. I am breathing in my home. I'm breathing in my home. Indeed, bomb clouds are everything that an architecture, a building once was. If you look at the material composition of what you see here as a bomb cloud, you'd realize that it's mostly pulverized concrete, but also it has some other elements like plaster, like glass, some wood, everything that the building once was. Um, some wood from furniture, some cloth from your curtain, some proportion of drugs from your bathroom. And indeed, even when people are dying in it, some human remains are in that. Sorry, I hear that the recording stopped, so, but you can continue recording as far as I'm concerned. Um, a building in gaseous form. Turning from, solid, turn, turning, turning from solid to gas and existing in the air throughout eight minutes, continuously transforming. Clouds are the epitome of transformation and metamorphosis. And each cloud is different. And this reality helped us in the next massive attack over Gaza, to analyze what happened in the strip. Back in 2014, another massive bombing of Gaza occurred. 
And Amnesty International and a Palestinian human rights organization called Al Mezan asked us to investigate one day, August 1st, 2014, the most lethal day within that conflict. We have received thousands, in fact, 70,000 clips and images from different parts of the Gaza Strip during that day. And the problem was how to make sense of them. You know, often the truth exists within an image, within a single image, within a single frame, you see both perpetrator and victim. And that is what is called a kind of a trophy evidence that has the story inside the frame. But most often the story exists in relation between images, not in one image, but in relation between three, between five, between 500, between 5,000 images that exist online. In one set of images, you would see ambulances. In another, you'd see tanks charging in. In another still, you'd see bombing. In another still, you would see civilians escaping with a white flag. How to make the connection between them? How to tell a story? You need to synchronize them. You need to determine, firstly, very technical, basic question. You need to geolocate and synchronize those images. You need to know which one exists in which time, what is the order of images and where they are in space. Online, when you harvest those images from social media, you do not have metadata on them. Metadata is information about the space and the time of those photographs, something that every photograph you take with your smartphone has inherent to the image. This is being stripped out by Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever other social media website uh, you're examining. And for very good reason. You don't want to risk the people taking those. But when you analyze, you need that back. And indeed, we were trying desperately to find the space and time of each one of those images and couldn't until we realized that we are looking at the wrong part of the image. We were looking at the ground, trying to approximate shadows, trying to find anything that we call physical clocks, physical indicators of time, whereas actually everything we needed and was invisible to us existed in the sky because the sky is unique at every moment and in every location because clouds, clouds, those clouds, both meteorological clouds and bomb clouds are metadata. So when you are syncing up those images, for example, you see a cloud in three different images coming from three different perspectives by three different photographers. You identify it's the same bomb cloud and you could synchronize and you know that those three are existing at the same time. And we have created something that we called Cloud Atlas and clear reference to British meteorological science that has emerged, in fact, as a co combination between scientists and artists back in the 19th century as the origin of the science of meteorology, cloud studies, when, um, um, you know, classification of a shape of an amorphous thing actually have taken place. So we created, we collected all the clouds, we gave a name or catalog number to each cloud. And then we identified the same clouds from different perspectives. And you can see that this moment here is a video that we have received from our friends in the medical emergency services of Gaza, driving towards the Israeli bombs in a desperate attempt to rescue civilians crashed under the rubble of their own homes, always having a camera at the front of their ambulance. And here, a photographer, a professional photographer from a roof capturing the same clouds at the same time. We know it's the same time, but we also see something very curious. The distance between this and this cloud is bigger here and smaller here. That means that we could reconstruct also the location by building three-dimensional clouds in our software. 
So finally, all this parametric bubble design that we've grown into and grew to despise actually as a, as a, as a form of architectural, um, um, you know, sort of exercise in the late 90s, early 2000s became useful for us. But then you're looking for how to anchor in time. So you can synchronize, you create clusters, clouds, now clouds of data, clusters of relation between images that have the same cloud, but you need one anchor in space. And the anchor was given to us by this incredible image, satellite image, there was one satellite image of Gaza during that day. It's passed over Gaza in a split of a second, took a photograph, and luckily or not, it had a cloud in it. So one cloud, and we know it's 11.39 in the morning because satellite images have the metadata uh, as part of the package that they sell you. So if we could uh, identify that cloud that we see here in plan, anywhere in elevation, from the ground, we could anchor everything. And what we see here, we measure the cloud, we identified that cloud. It took us weeks to do that. And now what we could do is anchor all the, all the clouds that we find in time. This is our Rosetta Stone, if you like, an amorphous shape of the skies with digital time. So now we know that whenever we would see that morphology, of cloud and we have it in three dimension, we know it's 11.49 uh, in the morning and, and henceforth we have synced up the whole skies over Gaza and hundreds and thousands of images and could invert the, the, the created timeline, finally create a timeline by comparing the clouds and then invert our gaze from the, from the skies to the ground and look at the testimonies of Palestinians under this ruthless bombardment and actually tell a story. But the story and the synchronization of a cloud of data came from the physical bomb cloud, those artificial meteorological, military meteorological event that invaded the sky over Gaza. But here you would see something else. What is the meaning of architecture now? We talked about the architecture of a cloud, a certain parametric bubble that continuously transforms in relation to the physical architecture. Gases architecture, mushrooming over solid architecture. Here is a clinic or a hospital in Rafah, uh, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip that has been bombed. Uh, by that bomb cloud, in order to find exactly where this image is, you create geolocation by matching the image into our model. The model becomes an optical device. A model holds together, an urban model of Rafa holds together all bomb cloud, all images, uh, all those hundreds of images within it. It becomes a way of synchronizing and developing another mode of viewing. We know that in, in um, the history of cinema, the montage, the cut, the splice, the edit is the most important act, the kind of dialectic uh, montage of Eisenstein, for example, that shrinks time and space. We need to develop an alternative to linear viewing. We create a navigational viewing Within, uh, within architectural models in which the model allows us to move from one image to the other image, right? And move back and forth between an image and an image. A model architecture becomes a mode of seeing, it, an alternative to the linear montage and the edit, a three-dimensional navigational viewing that allow you to move from one to the other. But sometimes when you look so closely at clouds, you start seeing other things. Here, a split second before um, we all, before it hits the ground, 
because we slow down the, the, the video into one frame at a time, we see a bomb. I wish we could stop that bomb because that single bomb is killed. Oh, there's, there's two bombs actually. Those, those two bombs are actually just the, a result of the interlacing of the video. It's a single bomb. You know, in video, you have two kind of still frame interlacing that gives you the kind of the sensation of, of continuous movement. Uh, it has killed 16 people in the Gaza Strip. And um, you see now another one. And identifying those, the lawyers at Amnesty asked us, could you actually tell us which bomb it is? And again, architecture is the only thing that can help you here. You put it into a model. We know where it hit the ground, so we know where it is in, the, in, in space. We can draw a plane. We can locate where the videographer is, put the plane as it intersects the bomb. And actually, this allows us to put uh, a grid behind it and allow us to measure it. It's incredible, no? You can see the size of the bomb and you can identify it while in action and then go to the catalog and identify a one-ton bomb a one-ton bomb, the biggest in the sort of conventional arsenal of the Israeli occupation air force uh, that um, dropped in the middle of a residential area, completely in disregard um, of um, disregard of any of any sort of responsibility of any humanity to the Palestinians, there, where the civilians are living in the middle of a of a city, and that allows us to uh, to bring that claim i spoke about cloud studies and i said that cloud study emerged in the 19th century as a certain strange relation between scientists and artists and i think that this is what forensic architecture is also uh, we are a group of artists architects scientists lawyers computer coders journalists working together so that moment in the 19th century with scientists and artists were working together was extremely uh, important for us. Um, classifying clouds has also always been a kind of a specific sort of endeavor because you try to classify clouds as if they have a genus and type, as if they are animals or plants, although they morph continuously and shift from one to the other. Um, indeed, the problem of capturing and analyzing clouds was always that the cloud moved faster than the painter hand could capture it. And then you see systems in the 19th century that are actually very useful for us in our cloud studies and in our cloud perspective of analysis by John Ruskin, uh, how to capture cloud, how to treat cloud as if they are objects and always impossibility and necessity and impossibility at the same time. So that the problem of clouds, the problem it, it was that in the beginning of modernity or with landscape painting, such as the Dutch land famous, Dutch famous landscape painting, the ground could be in modernity in the sense that it could be subjected to the rules of perspectives as objects of mapping of possession of lands but the sky was still in the Middle Ages. So if you see those paintings, the two parts of the painting belongs to two different periods in the history of art. The ground is in modernity, the sky is in the Middle Ages because it had to be imagined. It was more like about mood. It was more about the divinity. It was more about um, spirituality than about an actual description of objects. When you speak about clouds, the problem is that you have to deal with that paradox of trying to give shape to something that doesn't have shape, trying to give shape to something that's continuously transforming. Here, this is a moment in our analysis of the Grenfell Tower fire, you know, the, the tower of social housing that criminally burned in the center of London uh, in full view of most residents of London, I think it's the biggest trauma in recent history of London 
seeing people burning in the middle of the town, mainly migrants community stacked up carelessly within a tower with inflammable um, uh, uh, cladding. We were interviewing residents and the most important thing that they told us was the fog that they entered into, being inside a cloud. When you think about cloud, you're always between shape and an atmosphere. When you're inside of it, a cloud is a, a sort of a perspectival, immersive experience of fog. When you're outside of it, you are in this sort of impossible way of trying to describe it. Here, the fog of the Grenfell Tower allow us to estimate where each one of the residents uh, was actually rescued in the absence of uh, kind of like designation of time. We had to really build up artificial fog on the computer in order to estimate this. Tear gas is another kind of weaponization of the atmosphere, weaponization of the air. Here I am in Nabi Saleh, uh, one of the Palestinian villages under incursion by colonies, by Israeli colonies, uh, the taking continuously over their land. And every weekend there is a demonstration uh, that is going towards the main road. Uh, the Israeli soldiers here in this perfect spring day, um, but what you see here in this perfect spring day in that is actually the remnants of a tear gas canister. Tear gas, obviously a kind of anti-democratic substance that intox intoxicate the air so as to disperse unarmed civilian protest is also um, um, has a kinetic force because what is being shot is the canister in great speed. At some point, I'm running with another protester towards the soldiers. If you get closer to the soldiers, you, you go through the wall of tear gas. Uh, we are being noticed, uh, and this soldier over here is shooting one canister that hits the head of the woman right next to me. Um, that kind of, this is now in Turkey, in uh, Taksim Square, the sort of response, this authoritarian state response to protest by making the air you breathe unbreathable. Uh, if protest, democratic protest in, in public space is about gathering, is about bodies together in proximity, tear gas tries to uh, actually uh, you know, push them uh, away. Uh, in, in one of my books called The Roundabout Revolution, I described the way in which roundabouts became those centers of activity during the Arab Spring, but also this is Taksim Square um, here in Manama, in Bahrain. Um, roundabout become those kind of uh, magnets uh, for public gathering and the intoxication of air here was just simply burn the state, makes the air unbreathable in order to disperse. But the same things was happening in Hong Kong and here uh, in Chile, another roundabout uh, during the brutal repression uh, in December 2019, where we've written a script that could count and locate uh, all tear gas canisters within that. And here, mathematical simulation actually gives shape uh, to something that is invisible, completely invisible. So a combination between open source analysis based on photography, mathematical simulation, give an approximation of the shape of the cloud, something that is now operative in court cases in Chile, um, et cetera. When we were invited, forensic architecture is actually performing a lot in courts. Uh, you've heard that before, we provide evidence to courts, we provide evidence to truth commissions and other uh, forms of justice, but we also work a lot in the art spaces. And we were invited to show at the Whitney as part of the Whitney Biennale of, Architect of Art. Um, and then we realized that the art space is not simply an alternative to showing work in court and yet another forum to address another crowd, 
and seek accountability, but that the art spaces themselves could be sites of human rights violation. And so it was at the Whitney when it was discovered that the vice chair of the Whitney board, a man called Warren Candace, was a trader, was making his money, money that contributed to the very exhibition we were part of by selling tear gas. So we got into the museum and we decided to investigate the museum in the museum. Uh, and we've undertaken, uh, a you know, we wanted to know where the vice chair of the Whitney board is selling his gas to. Um, unlike weapons, lethal weapons, tear gas doesn't have a public record when it is sold. You need to, if you want to know where uh, the Whitney, the vice chair of the Whitney board, his company called Safari Land, also a kind of colonial name, Safari Land, horrible name, is selling their tear gas, you need to scan online archives and find canisters with their logo. Uh, it's a product after all, uh, to, to, to know where it is. Here, this is um, uh, in different places in the world where it was known where they're, they're selling it. You could see something very strange here. Sorry, that is an aside. This is the border between the US and Mexico. Kinetic violence, object-based violence, abide to the laws of sovereignty. Here is an international border that cannot be crossed, but the gas is an amorphous and it moves, though it is shot in the US, the cloud actually can travel across the international border into Tijuana, which is in Mexico, and attack what was called at the time the caravan of migrants trying to uh, enter uh, the US. Um, so our attempt, here is the, the, um, the kind of the logos that we were looking for, how to find them. Forensic architecture is... So basically you look for, you scan online uh, and you look for uh, triple chases. Triple chases is the name of the product. Here we are in Palestine. Here is the catalog. We're looking uh, to familiarize ourselves with that. Um, and we decided there's just simply too many. This, the web is too big to look in the wild, so to speak, for those objects. It was just taking too much work. And what we decided to do is to train a machine learning algorithm to help us do it. So as not to automate this form of study, but to break it apart. The machine learning algorithm would bring us the first triage of what it thinks triple chasers canisters are, and then our researchers would verify it and we would have the map uh, of where it is. How do you teach machine to see? Very much like you teach a child to see. You show it a lot of samples of what is a triple chaser canister. You say, that's a triple chaser canister. That's a triple chaser canister. Also this is, and that is, and this is, and this, and that, and that. And usually right now, when you have thousands, let's say 10,000 images of a single object, you are able to actually, the machine can automatically go on and, uh, and find it by itself. So this is called uh, a visual data set for a machine learning classifier. The problem was that we could find only a few hundred samples of that canister online. And what we had to do was actually to trick the classifier into identifying those. So we started working with activists. Sorry. Sorry, I'm listening. Should I, should I stop? Okay, it's good, it's good, it's good. I yeah. continue? It's good, it's good. Matome? A conversation. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Here, somebody in Tijuana uh, doesn't want to identify himself, find us uh, a triple chase, a canister for our project. And then uh, my very good friend, Emily Jassir, uh, uh, an artist from Bethlehem, is finding one and scanning it to me with her camera. 
something that allows us to build a three-dimensional object of it um, and then compare it to the catalog of uh, the, the dimensions. And then we are able to trick the machine into believing that these are real photographs of triple chaser canister, which we can give it all sorts of permutations uh, and allow fake images, if you like, to actually find real images. So we make all the permutation of rust and, and suit on it from all different perspectives that allow us to actually uh, trick the machine into uh, thinking uh, to, to, uh, and these is actually the data set. So the data set itself uh, and the funky kind of um, background that you see are a synthetic way to generate difference between figure and ground that allow you actually to create all the permutation that allow the machine to see. So this film is a film that we showed at the, at the, at the museum but it is simultaneously a machine for humans and for computers, because that is each one of those frames is what would teach the machine to actually see. So this is uh, at the end. This is how uh, the, the machine actually signify. find find those things and, and bring home uh, from the wild, from the internet. And that led to the resignation, or that it contributed along with other activists' work to the resignation of this board member and for his disinvestment from tear gas, showing that the art world can actually be a site of accountability. Look, I have much more here about Black Lives Matter uh, protest in, in the US and how, and how you analyze patterns uh, of violation uh, in it. Um, um, showing our work in the U.S. on the on the suppression of the BLM Detection. protest um, and on uh, the use of herbicides uh, for a simulation of herbicide uh, again on the Gaza border um, and um, chemical warfare. I'm just going very fast because I, I assume that my time is done, but uh, to a certain extent our work with chemical warfare uh, has led to our understanding that actually um, clouds are also clouds of doubt, that negation is something that uh, a kind of another sort of ambientic uh, sort of form of violence, that negation of facts of, you know, the violence of, chemical strikes in Syria of climate change is also creating a kind of a fog as an epistemological condition. Here is a Twitter map, another cloud of a debate around one of the most controversial uh, chemical strikes uh, in Syria, going all the way to continental scale clouds resulting from the burning of the forest in uh, uh, in, in Papua and Indonesia, uh, and the kind of negation uh, that comes uh, from it. I think I would need to pass now to my friend and mentor, Sean Rothbard, uh, to continue um, or to move on. Robert, but you, 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 please continue with the Lebanon, with Beirut. Just show, show the Beirut uh, investigation. Okay, in, in Beirut, Interestingly enough, we con collected also hundreds of pictures of the cloud of the explosion, the port explosion, in order to analyze the cloud for its color and shape, in order to reconstruct how the warehouse inside was actually um, organized. Uh, so we're looking at the, at the kind of like a, the changing of the color of the cloud and we see that it's moving from white to black and we could understand that here is where for example the tires that were stored in the facility caught fire uh, and later on um, we see the um, the sparkles of the fireworks that were inside leading to the biggest cloud of all the biggest sort of uh, bomb that has blasted in the middle east in fact 
um, that um, and basically based on that, again, taking clouds as metadata, I don't wanna to go too much into that, but modeling cloud as three-dimensional moving object allow us to understand uh, the way that thing uh, has unfolded. Okay, I think enough for me, on to you. Uh, maybe I should uh, introduce you, Sharon, would you think that's right? I will just do a short introduction. You are the host, we are, we are the guests. Uh, yes, so um, yeah, I'd like to invite uh, Sharon, Sharon Ratbard, uh, to uh, into a conversation with Yal. Uh, Sharon is a <clears throat> Tel Aviv-based architect, writer, editor, educator, and neighborhood activist. He's also the co-founder of Babel Press. Um, he has authored several books, uh, including White City, Black City in 2005, uh, Abharam Yaski, A Concrete Architecture, I hope I said that correctly, in 2007, White City, Black City, Architecture and War in Tel Aviv and Jaffa with the MIT Press in 2015, uh, War of the Street and Houses and Other Texts on the City, in, which is a forthcoming book. He is also the ed editor of Refusenik's uh, Trials, uh, which he edited with Don Hannon and Michael Sfard. Uh, and, uh, he, is also, uh, he has also founded and has uh, been uh, the editor of uh, actually hundreds of uh, titles of books uh, in Hebrew on architecture, uh, uh, titles that include Le Corbusier, uh, uh, Adolf Loos, Jacobs, Venturi, Scott and Brown. He also edits uh, titles uh, on contemporary literature, including Bernhard, uh, Carrere, uh, Hollebeck, um, Mantel, Perek, etc. Um, Sharon and Ial first collaborated in the beginning of 2000 at the occasion of the exhibition and catalog uh, titled A Civilian Occupation the politics of Israeli architecture uh, in which he curated with Eyal and Rafi Segal. Uh, the exhibition and uh, the catalog were then censored by the Israeli Association of Architects who had commissioned it in the first place. Uh, Sharon, welcome you to enter into conversation and speak if you like on, uh, with Eyal. Thank you. Yes, just a few corrections. I haven't uh, published hundreds of architecture books, but books in general, and more importantly, uh, I was not uh, part of the curation team of the uh, exhibition. It was Eyal uh, uh, Weizmann and uh, uh, Rafi Segal. I just helped them out uh, later uh, in uh, the publication. So I just uh, first, uh, I mean, it, I would like first to, to, to thank you uh, and Poche, all the uh, people of Poche who um, uh, volunteered to uh, to host this uh, uh, this venue, and I think that uh, uh, as I um, listened to you earlier, uh, with all was that happening in uh, uh, in Gujarat and in Ahmedabad, I think that those kind of approaches, such as Ayaz are uh, extremely important uh, uh, to, uh, to learn from and to maybe to adopt or to copy or to, uh, to do all kinds of those uh, investigations uh, uh, in India. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that, for example, all this cloud science uh, could uh, uh, help out uh, a lot of uh, activists uh, in, uh, in New Delhi, for example, which is uh, quite so quite much quite much often uh, in live live lives like in, in a cloud. So just a few words. Uh, um, so I, I I would really like to thank you for um, I mean organizing this uh, this talk because uh, uh, as um, you might know uh, this could not happen uh, I think in any. Um, other, uh, let's say, way uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, so um, 
I would say it is it is a nice uh, way to uh, to keep on uh, di dialogue uh, in various condition conditions, and I think it is also the uh, proper um, platform to uh, such dialogues to uh, to take place. So first of all, uh, Eyal, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very generous uh, introduction. I don't know where he is. Did he disappear? Eyal, you are with me, or you? You smoke a cigarette or something? I'm here, I'm here. I'm listening to you. So um, I must say that I first met Eyal, uh, uh, I think it was maybe 20 years ago. He was, he was very young at the time. Uh, it was just after his uh, diploma. And I think that uh, maybe uh, five seconds after he entered the room, uh, I knew that this is one of the wisest men I've ever met. And uh, I, am, I must say that uh, since then, um, uh, this impression, I mean, I'm, I mean, he's, uh, Eyal is very, a very impressive guy, as you also uh, all uh, um, seen, but I mean, he's, he's getting smarter uh, and smarter. So he's today much smarter than he was uh, 20 years ago, uh, which I think that I cannot say about uh, myself. Um, I mean, it, it gets better. And I think uh, the importance of his work, uh, I mean, uh, speaks for, uh, for itself. It is quite widely uh, uh, acknowledged. So just for uh, uh, the... Um, you mentioned the uh, uh, catalog uh, edited and curated by uh, Eyal and, uh, and Rafi Segal. So I just would like to show this piece of, uh, of history, uh, which uh, as, uh, it, as it appears has uh, completely, uh, was completely forgotten in, in a sense. Uh, but uh, 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 it is important to know that, that uh, this collaboration, and it's not, not, it's, it is not just Eyal and Rafi, and it is not just me, it was quite a large group of, of uh, architects and artists and uh, photographers. Uh, I could mention also uh, uh, Tzvi Efrat or, or Miki Kratzman uh, or Gidon Levy or, or the late uh, Meron Ben Benishti, a lot of people who uh, participated in this uh, venture, which uh, uh, strive to say for the first time that there is some kind of relationship between uh, politics and architecture. Now, in uh, uh, Israel, uh, architecture uh, is, of course, something that you uh, study in school, you uh, um, uh, you write articles, well, of course, everybody designs a uh, building. Uh, but uh, in the context where uh, architecture becomes a kind of uh, uh, national uh, directive, a national task, uh, and architecture is uh, what it is all about. Uh, we build uh, new villages, new settlements, uh, new colonies all, all the time. Uh, and sometimes we uh, we demolish uh, other people's houses. Uh, so in fact, it is all about uh, building and demolishing uh, the whole political business uh, in Israel. In Israel, uh, while architecture uh, somehow uh, has been, and I think still is, um, it keeps on working uh, as if we were living in Sweden or in Switzerland. Uh, so, for example, the main architectural uh, chapter or history of, uh, of Israel is the, uh, the white city of Tel Aviv. Uh, or we uh, always try to see how much uh, Israeli architecture is, uh, resembles or conforms to uh, the architecture of its times in uh, other places. Uh, but uh, in general, the... Um, the idea that architecture uh, can can be uh, discussed as a, uh, as, a as a sphere uh, as an independent sphere uh, without any relation to its uh, um, uh, use or uh, with its uh, political significance, uh, this has been and I think still is 
uh, part of the Israeli uh, uh, mainstream uh, thing, the thought. Uh, and at the time, Eyal and, and, uh, and Rafi, uh, they um, won a, an architectural competition organized by uh, the Israeli uh, Association of Architects. And uh, they um, uh, proposed a different reading of uh, Israeli uh, architectural uh, uh, history uh, from the settlements, the rural settlements in the 30s throughout uh, what Sifat called uh, the Israeli uh, project uh, to uh, the uh, later uh, national projects of uh, settlements in the occupied uh, territories after after 1967. So in fact, it gave uh, this uh, catalog, which was uh, printed in I think uh, six or seven thousand copies uh, in the uh, press of the uh, newspaper uh, Haaretz. Um, so in this catalog, in fact, gave a quite clear, um, I would say, timeline of. Uh, of the, is the political significance of, uh, of Israeli uh, uh, architecture. So um, strangely, um, at, at the very last moment, after all those uh, copies were printed by uh, the newspaper Aretz, uh, the Israeli Association uh, decided to uh, back off and to uh, cancel the uh, um, uh, Eyal and Rafi's venue. I think it was meant to be uh, in Berlin. And uh, they decided to scrap all the copies, uh, all the copies of the catalog. So like they uh, scrapped some few thousands of copies of printed copy of the catalog. Uh, luckily, uh, Eyal and me, we uh, uh, just, you know, like, Few days before, a couple of days before uh, they scrapped the catalog, we uh, we took the car and we went to the printer and we took a few hundred of copies. So what I have is a kind of very rare copy uh, saved uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the uh, association. And uh, uh, and finally, I mean, just the mere act of of censorship. Um, generated a huge uh, scandal, uh, which became very, very quickly uh, international, uh, with uh, articles in uh, uh, in, uh, in the English or the American press, in the New York Times, uh, etc., and so on, so on. So uh, uh, um, later on, of course, and and uh, you mentioned it too, we. Uh, uh, republished the book uh, with few uh, additions and, and corrections. Um, and it was a kind of a joint venture between my press and uh, uh, Verso Press in uh, uh, in London, which I think remained uh, until today. Yala is publisher, is English publisher, or you have other publishers too right now, I think. Anyway, uh, um, my point is that uh, at the time I thought that uh, personally when I uh, was engaged in EAL or I met EAL's project, I had also, I would say, a certain tendency to try to um, uh, develop a certain political uh, critique vis-a-vis uh, -vis the architectural practice uh, in Israel. Uh, but my point is that uh, at the time I uh, was thinking that I'm doing quite a good thing uh, for the Israeli architecture. Um, so I, I, I think that I really honestly um, and perhaps maybe innocently or naively, naively it would, would be a better word, um, believe that uh, uh, we are doing this and things might be uh, better. Uh, but somehow, um, I think that we both somehow, Eyal and me, uh, found ourselves at least within uh, uh, the spectrum of what might be called uh, Israeli architecture or the Israeli architectural uh, community. Uh, we found ourselves in a certain uh, position of uh, banishment um, 
of course, Eyal who lives abroad, uh, uh, it is uh, much clearer because he's also engaged in the, uh, uh, in, in the boycott uh, uh, against, uh, in the boycott movement. Uh, but uh, I would say that it, uh, it somehow, it created the situation, at least for me, and I think for quite few others, uh, that uh, not only uh, it problematizes uh, the very possibility of, uh, of uh, practicing architecture uh, in Israel, uh, but I think that it even, it, it more, more than that, it uh, problematized the uh, very possibility to, make, to do architecture uh, in general. Uh, which means that from the very first moment that you start uh, uh, regarding all this, uh, all those things that usually architects uh, um, tend to overlook, uh, which means, in fact, all that happened uh, before the bidding was completed and all that happened after the bidding uh, was completed. So in fact, we are usually architect, they strive for a, 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 a very brief moment, which is the moment of uh, inauguration of the photographing of the completed bidding. Uh, but in fact, uh, if, we, uh, if we just overlook only this moment, which is a very nice and happy moment, uh, but if we look almost of everything that happens before, and everything that might happen after, uh, uh, of course, there's a huge amount of uh, violence which uh, associated uh, in it, starting from how you grab the land, uh, continuing with the uh, with the uh, all the process of uh, construction, which is uh, sometimes very violent and uh, uh, and and requires uh, the use of violence against. Uh, uh, very weak uh, populations, migrant workers, such as uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Riaz. Uh, and of course, uh, later, all the question of uh, responsibility, if we, if we were speaking of accidents or um, um, uh, problems or, or, or fires, such as uh, Eyal uh, showed us uh, in this um, uh, housing tower in London, uh, so, in fact, there are a lot of things that uh, we uh, uh, tend to overlook uh, and which are really um, uh, quite easily or, or obviously associated with, with, uh, uh, with accidents or, or, with, uh, or, or with violence. Uh, so, um, um, as I, I would like just to, to end my uh, quite... Um, I would say uh, improvised Jugad uh, uh, intervention uh, by uh, saying that uh, I, 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 and this is something I would like to ask uh, Eyal because what really characterized his uh, work, I think from the very beginning is uh, sometimes this idea to take uh, architectural uh, instruments and kind of divert them uh, and to um, kind of turn them around you know, to use, to, to understand other things such uh, using the section uh, in order to uh, uh, understand the politics of verticality or, uh, uh, or using uh, the parametric um, uh, kind of fashion of architecture in order to understand uh, 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 war crimes. Uh, so in a sense, uh, of course, it, for me, it's very clear how Eyal is, is, is uh, I mean, using his, uh, his knowledge, his uh, architectural tradition, uh, his way of looking to understand what a perspective is. Uh, so I, I don't know if there should be any uh, journalist or scientist who knows what is a perspective uh, and how it's constructed. So I think that uh, in this sense, uh, I think Eyal does it in a, in a genius way. I, I myself, I feel that I'm kind of in a, uh, uh, how would I say, a dead end in a sense because I am, uh, kind of um, entangled in all kinds of uh, of uh, of um, 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 I would say barriers or 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 um, or limits that I I, I don't want uh, uh, to cross. But I think that somehow I really found a very 
uh, interesting and productive way to uh, use architecture and to use architectural tradition uh, in order to do uh, other things. But I, I would uh, uh, just like to ask, uh, Eyal, it is, of course, it is quite clear that you are dissident in your own homeland. Uh, but uh, do you feel like me also dissident in your own uh, profession? It's a, it's a good question. I, I, I think that um, a lot of people ask me, what, what's architecture about it? And um, there is a, there's a very good um, analogy you know, with a historian given by Carlo Ginzburg who's the historian I, I adore and love most, both as a writer and in coming up with a new historical method, right? So I think that, you know, as practitioners of architecture, you have, we have a method, we can do things, we can, we can make better or worse within our architecture methodology and toolbox. But I think where, it, where you hack into the source code of your profession is if you mine within it uh, a new method and a new way of being an architect. And Carlo Ginzburg said, who, who, by the way, who he kind of invented, invented developed, theorized uh, the, the idea of microhistory against the Marxist historians of the long duration that you know drew the history of capital, the history of environments over hundreds of years, the anal, famous French Annal School. He said, no, history exists in the moment. Yeah, and, but that referred to said referred. And and in that moment you can see the long duration in that in it exists in the molecular level of history. And I think that what we do is something like not micro history, but molecular history. When we work <clears throat> for a year on a day in Gaza, when we work for a year and a half on a split second in Chicago or in Palestine, we find in a molecular level of time, in a component, in, in, in the bodily movement, in a trajectory of bullets, in a morphology of the wound, we find traces of a long duration of colonialism, of apartheid, of um, you know long-term um, uh, sort of like politics. Uh, it exists in a moment, manifests itself in a moment, and the trick is always to go in and out. So I, I you know, I mentioned Carlo Ginzburg, who really theorized that topological relation. And I think it's super important for us as architects to understand that in a building, you can find history, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of like in, a, in an analysis of a single piece of architecture, you can write it on itself and then the object collapse upon itself and you've done nothing. Or you can find in a concrete, in a style, in the way the windows are drawn, in a way that everything is organized there, the shadows of history and speak back for exploding that moment in an almost kind of Benjaminian sense, no? in, a, in a sense of the fetish, in a way that the object could speak back to history that has produced it, right? History coalesces slowly into form. An analysis of form is an explosion that can speak back to history, right? back and forth. It's really like a blast, you no? Know? And Benjamin has this incredible way of describing it. But Carlo Ginzburg said on history, and I will paraphrase to architecture, architecture is not our home. Architecture is not our prison. Architecture is like an airport from which we travel in different destinations. We go. We started in architecture and we moved to image analysis, we moved to cinema, we moved to psychology, a different direction we travel. It's always our home, but it's like an airport, like a hub of an airport. We always go back there and fly out 
to another place, but carry something of architecture with us, right? So obviously we've overgrown <laughs> the architectural part of forensic architecture, if you like, but something of the uh, making, the constitution of the architect, the sort of the, uh, the architectural theory, the sense of materiality, of texture, of form, the attention to detail exists in everything that we take forward. And now we have decided in forensic architecture never to do what interests us, only to work to commissions. And we've learned it the hard way. We learn that you enter the space of other people's trauma always invited. You always need to be welcomed. And somehow like an architect, you know, you would say, oh, I'm interested in this, what happened in Mexico. I'm interested in my, you know, the area I come from now in Palestine. No, we don't do things that interest us. We do when we are asked and when we are welcomed. And this is also something that has an architectural dimension to it. One, two in answering your question. What enabled us to operate like in a way that we do was a certain seemingly simple shift. We started in forensic architecture as the architecture being the object of analysis. Traces left on buildings, clouds made out of building elements, ruins being something like Deleuze called the archaeologist of a present, you know, the archaeologist of yesterday, trying to tell from a ruin, reconstruct from a ruin, what happened, what kind of relation happened around it. This is how we started. Two, what now, architecture as a method of analyzing something else. The crime is not no longer committed by architects or by those destroying the building, but architecture is the milieu that can synthesize data, can synthesize images, that can help us understand and interpret. And something, that break happened in my book, Hololand, in the middle of the book, Hololand, when, you know, like it's to one extent, yes, it's a story of architecture of colonialism. At some other point, it takes the architectural section. It says, let's look what happens to politics when you draw a section through it. And architecture becomes a mean of analysis rather than the object mm -hmm. of investigation. And when you say it's the mean of analysis, architecture can speak back to psychology, can speak back to computer science, could speak back to uh, image and cinema and all those things that are composed together, and law that are composed together to the extent that right now, and you know, I'm not saying that to, you know, to kind of aggrandize forensic art, but you need to know that both the New York Times, the Washington Post, BBC have set up forensic architecture organizations, we advise them in, uh, yeah, on the formation. I know, I know. And they do that. Human rights organizations do it. The International Criminal Court does it. So in a sense, it's accepted by law, by human rights, by, by, by media, as a way of telling a story, as a way of understanding situation. And in fact, for anyone that does open source analysis, a collection of, of material from online, understands that you cannot view, it's not one way of viewing images, you cannot view, there's no other way. You need architecture to view images because it's about, today viewing is not about the image, but about the relation between images and the relation between images is spatial and architectural. So that is, you know, that is really what enabled us to move it's to unlock a certain barrier. Excuse me? I think this is very important that it is not only about images, but the, about the relationship between images. That you, you cannot just look at, at one perspective image or one plan or one whatever. You have always to somehow to look at them at, at a set of images. Yeah. So you don't want to build anymore? Uh, any other question? Maybe the students. Maybe from the students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take a uh, question from the students, please. Because I don't have tons of time, so maybe. Uh, no, maybe neither, we'll take... uh, John, what uh, do you say? We'll take like three questions together, one after the other, and then we we we, we go at them yes. together. So this is for the quickest and the fittest. I I would like to ask. If I may. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the really good. good um, 
uh, talk. I also want to thank you. I visited the uh, not a while ago the um, exhibition in Berlin. Um, so I got to see. I, I spent a few hours there, and I got to see in very details all of the a lot of the of your work. So um, thank you. And a question that got to my head when you talked about the the tear gas um, canisters and the, the way you <clears throat> you made the machine, you forged images in order to let the machine learn to um, to to see the canisters is um, in a, in a lot of your works the 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 imagery from from um, open sources and from um, private uh, video videographers and and uh, images is very profound to the to the work and so the question is how how can you avoid um, counting on um, forged images or or manipulated images in this huge ocean of data that is out there. Got you. Understood, Eitan. It's a very good question, and I'll, I'll come back at it. More questions? Yeah. If, if, yeah. Uh, I think I think it's a it's a great approach, and I think as an architect, one spatializes things that are not normally spatialized. And uh, I've been I've been looking at the spatialization of human rights which are spatialized at the level of the nation state, but not at the level of the city where they have to be negotiated on an everyday basis. And uh, therefore in India, we have master plan paradigms where half the city population cannot uh, afford to locate themselves on the master plan and have to operate outside it in a, in a zone that can be rendered criminal. And that's an act of violence. So my question is, the examples you showed are examples where the presence of violence is visible. And have you applied this technique to situations where uh, violence to the conventional gaze is invisible? Got you, Prem. Thank you. Any any other question? Maybe one more, and then um, you know we can Sean and I can engage them. No. Okay. You want to start, Sharon, or? No, you, it was addressed to you. Okay, so I'll start in the order. Eitan, thank you very much for your question and, and also for your interest. Um, verification is um, at the heart of our work. Um, I really love the word verification that comes from the same root as veritas, truth, but it turns it into a verb. I find that the word truth, when people talk to us about, you know, how do you know what the truth is? Do you actually, um, you know, believe in truth or all sort of idiotic things like that? Truth is what a priest would tell you is right or any state authority. It's a transcendent concept. Verification is an imminent concept is a verb, is a making, it's dynamic, it is constantly um, integrating new data and adapting its determination. Verification is a verb. Open verification is very important as our means of work. Um, in the era of post-truth, and I'm, I, I know it sounds a little bit like a detour, but I'm gonna catch the question. Um, or the essence of your question, I think, Eitan. Um, we are existing now in a time of great institutional crisis. What happened with Brexit and Trump are symptoms in the way, in the loss of faith that civil society, that society has in the custodians of truth, in the sort of institutions that are the kind of the power, the pillars of the power knowledge temple, police, the courts, even the mainstream big media, etc. 
And those that confront this sort of post-truth moment think that the best way to do it is by fighting a rear guard and propping up those institutions to the extent, to the ridiculous and offensive extent, that people think that or thought that the FBI should save us from Trump. Now, I cannot find anything more offensive than that. I think we need to accept the challenge of post-truth. We need to let the temple of power knowledge crumble and out of the rubble, build a new way of verification that does not need the authority of state institutions, but civil society takes to itself the task of verification by working on exactly that, which I called open verification, meaning rather than a university determining what the truth is, the court or the police, you create networks of associations between first and foremost, the people at the forefront of conflict, the people with the life experience of violence, so-called people that we used to call the victims, but they actually are at the forefront and with the knowledge to do that. The activists that take their sides, the lawyers perhaps, perhaps an art gallery somewhere else, um, a newspaper, and volunteers, the crowd of volunteers that actually help verify things in an open way online, not based on the authority of a source or an authority of an institution, but based on the thickness of the network of relation that Institute of Truth. And think about this piece about Triple Chaser, the verification with machine learning. It involved Emily Jassier and activists from Tijuana that was scanning the things for us. It involved lawyers pushing the things. It involved curator bringing it into the exhibition. It involved computer scientists. It involved, you know, us architects building that. And the relation between that is a solid social kind of, create a social fabric that its strength is the strength of verification. And this is a construction of a commons. We, used to, we think about the commons as being a river or forest or lake, and we defend it from pollution. But verification is the act of the commons, it's the basis of a commons. And that commons is a metapolitical condition that needs to be defended. How is it defended? not through vertical authentication, meaning vertical authentication is like you take a file and you dig into the, the way it is compressed, the way the pixels are organized, and you say, has it been intervened in? But through horizontal verification, meaning a fake piece of video would fall out of the matrix, right? If the minute that you have 70,000 images, forget about 70,000, you have 16 images that you sync up to create an event. The one that would fall out of the, of the weave of the fabric is the fake one, right? It will not agree with others. It will not, and the others, not only images, testimonies and material evidence, images from the ground, images from the air, and, you know, really mostly the testimonies of survivors or people in the, in the forefront. Um, we have an ability to authenticate through relations, not through the ontology, ontological kind of uh, examination of the object as object. It's very important. And that is our relation to truth. And it's very, much more important because instead of a, an act of an expert drilling in, to a file or an object. It's a social relation that holds truth together or holds the verification, the act of verification together, right? So you do two things. You create a community through the act of verification. That community, every evidence that is produced through open verification is both an evidence to the fact that happened into the community that is formed 
to investigate it. That is really the kind of the act of the commons. I, you know, there's a book that I that is is coming out any moment now. Is Verso called Investigative Aesthetics when it is discussed in great detail that uh, idea of truth as a common or verification as a commons. Um, in terms of visibility and invisibility, Prem, I think it's an absolutely great question. I think that we know and we need to extend our understanding of violence to economic violence, to legal violence, to environmental violence, each one with its own characteristics, each one bearing itself and manifesting itself in space, each one and also, you know, the psychic violence, something will become extremely and much more aware of as a form of oppression, as a form of violence that the people are subjected to, psychic terror. Um, we need to know how to use techniques of open verification, of bringing up, creating a community of practice that both investigate and resist and are held together by the fabric of truth that we produce in order to fight back and do two things to resist it, investigate and form communities of investigation. Simply the truth in itself is not going to help us. The truth and evidence is only as good as the social fabric that is there to produce it and to use it. The legal case is only as good as the political context in which it is produced and what it can ignite. And if you think about that relation, that topological relation, we must always insist on the relation between the split second and the long duration, right? You look at a small scale. You don't need to look at the entire city. Tell the story of one family. Tell the story of one home. Show how economic forces are suppressing, violating those people and get that act of finding to operate politically through the kind of social movement that is produced to mobilize it. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good way forward. Okay, that's my answers uh, or responses or thinking through it. Maybe Sean wants to say something and I think- No, I, I don't have much to add to do today. You are a little bit behind. No? One more question, if anybody would like to, I think then otherwise. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't think there are any. Thank you so can much. This, this, absolutely this, wonderful. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Please come in. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just, just a brief. Uh, I uh, thank you for that uh, presentation and provocation. Um, this is more. This is more a kind of a thought that <clears throat> grew from what you were just saying, because what you were discussing in terms of the cloud was amorphous and tangible, but what you were just culminating with uh, brought in a flood of new possibilities that the intangible, let's say the the uh, economic suppression of uh, social expression is intangible. A cloud is still amorphous but tangible. Uh, I began to see that that mapping could also begin. I was just wondering whether you'll have begun uh, that kind of a mapping as well, because this whole uh, redefinition of dystopia itself, I think is a violence against the commons which we are not defining for some reason. And I think the uh, culmination that you just made brought that very sharply uh, to me right now. Uh, is that a possibility? Are you all working on that? Which, is, which goes beyond the tangible. Uh, it may go into um, restricting location, restricting access, restricting information, and uh, really reveal what that uh, economic or political force is doing to kind of uh, disable a social expression of equity of a certain kind. So am I, am I on, uh, because I
because I think that's the promise I just saw when you came in. Till then, it was on the amorphous cloud, and you know the fact that there's an investigation and there's a forensic, which was which was tangible to a certain extent. Of course, it had an architectural reality, but you ended with the intangible, which which is which is also a lot of possibility. Would you have you already engaged in that, or am I making sense in what? I think that you, you, you probably made very good sense. I, I, I found it very difficult to hear you, uh, Basava, but I, I think I got the gist of what you were saying. Um, you know, we, we have in forensic architecture areas of investigation, kind of more conceptual proposition. One is the long duration of the split second, another is cloud studies, and there are many other Kind of conceptual questions we're dealing with and we are extending the frame the conceptual framework of thinking about cloud as we see more examples for example our work now on the nso uh, which i all i invite you all to look at under digitalviolence.org um, you could see that is also part of digital cloud analysis uh, it's about a cloud for us is both material and amorphous. It is both digital and physical. It is both a condition, an optical condition of immersion and an external position of, you know, of mapping. It's all those things. A cloud embodies contradiction. It's a, a discursive cloud. It is a way in which, you know, people that try to intoxicate the public domain, bring in doubt, weaponize doubt into it. Um, and it's really through the intersections of these ideas that we build up the, the kind of the notion of clouds. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful, wonderful talk and uh, provocation. Bye, as well. uh, said. Have Bye, fun. Bye, Shalom. Say hello Bye, to everybody. Ah, Nishir Kerem, so Nishat Shalom Nikulam. Bye. It was Bye. very nice to very nice to to meet you. I hope um, you know we continue the relation with Porsche in the future. Bye. 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 To Dial. Okay, so. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for being part of this and uh, inviting us to ho host this. It was uh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for host me, hosting me. <laughs> and we will invite you back with. Uh, yeah, so I invite the... you back to our next venue uh, at, uh, at the other Zoom. Uh, so now I think we have a break until. Uh, uh, two o'clock or four thirty, right? In India. Okay. So see you later, and uh, goodbye.